Can you believe we're at the National Religious Broadcasting I Convention? I believe it. I can hear it all around me. <laughs> in Nashville, Tennessee. Yes. And the year is 2020. Does that mean something to you? I love 2020. <laughs> Clear vision. Perfect vision. He likes 17, too. Yeah, that's Those true. Are, he's got that, a lot of numbers true. that he likes. Tell him about our good friend who has been with us. I think he just... He just suggested at least a hundred years. He didn't remember your name a few minutes ago. <laughs> anyway, we have Dr. Ted Bear with us today. He has been friends. He, he says for probably about 30 years. He is so well known and so unbelievable. Well, he's founder and publisher of Movie Guide. And we all know Movie Guide. That's great. And chairman of the Christian Film and Television Commission. He hangs out with all those Hollywood stars out there. Yeah. He's a and survives. noted critic, educator. Got all kinds of degrees, lecturer, media pundit, and his life's purpose to be used by God to redeem the values of the media. And boy, does the media need redeeming. And go, so he's good. <laughs> use the website because he has information that you will want. Please use that website. And I'm telling you, everything Ted Bear does, well, it looks like a Rolls Royce. <laughs> it is the best. I'm telling you. You can prove it by getting it. Good to have you. Oh, it's great you're, to be here. <laughs> you're the I most... can't hear you very well because there's all this noise around here. Well, my you... son is passing by right now and my and one of my people. Hey, come here. Come here. <laughs> come here. Come here. He's, he's not coming, right? Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Okay. How's it going? Good to see you. This is the guy that runs the whole place. Oh my <laughs> he goodness. runs it. I just hey, Robbie. Are you are you as brilliant as he as he is? He's better. No. Better. I mean, you. So so you got his gene? Yeah. He's got a lot of good. He's brilliant. Good, uh, he he is absolutely yeah. off the chart. Yeah. Nice to meet you. Yeah. He is. Great to meet you guys too. Good to meet you, man. How many degrees, colleges? Okay, well, I've, I've been to a lot of schools. I graduated from Dartmouth, summa cum laude. I uh, went to Cambridge University of Bordeaux in Toulouse. I've got uh, a law degree. I've got a, uh, two doctorates, uh, one in theology. And, and, you know, so anyway, I've got a lot of degrees. What is it that makes a person want to get all that education? Don't you get sick you of know, eating? You know, people have different gifts. Yeah. And what I say is that, because I teach, I was head of a department at Berkeley, berserkly, and I loved it. And I was head of a department at City University of New York. And people have different gifts. God gives people gifts. And it's how you use those gifts that matter. You can use those gifts to make, like Bill Bright did with John Heyman, the Jesus film, or you can use them to make something evil. So what we have to do is encourage people that God doesn't take the gift away. You know, and studying was easy for me. and. Getting A's was easy for me. It just depends upon the person. However, my son that you just met is good at finance. And he's guy. always been good at finance. And he's the one who got us up to 41 million. And he's, you know, the Hallmark Channel and all that. Because he's brilliant at doing business and finance. Don't make me do business. <laughs> God didn't give me that gift. How did you get into what you do? I grew up in the industry. My father was a very famous star. He's most famous now for a cowboy series, Tex Ranger. Uh, he was the first Texas Ranger, Bob Tex Allen. And he won the box office award in 1936. I grew up in a non-Christian home. My mother was a star. Uh, my father, after World War II, starred on Broadway for years. He was a great singer. He starred. He, uh, but, um, you know, I was... I was adrift. So when my mother died when I was young, I did a lot of nefarious activity. And finally, four women, one of them who was interested in my father, she was single, had come to Christ through Billy Graham. And they started taking him to Christian events. And he'd take me to protect them. And after a couple of months of me walking out and saying these Christians are crazy, I became one. And then I knew they were crazy. So, <laughs> so <laughs> no, the woman asked me, why don't you read the Bible and tell me what's wrong with it? And Cliff, which does great work, and it's not too far from you, it's on Orlando, uh, says 60% of the people come to Christ through reading the Bible. So the Word of God will not go forth void. And you, you know this because you've got C.S. Lewis who, and all these great writers, Chesterton, people who came to Christ through 
the Bible. It's a great tool to get people to come to You have a gala event every year we do. that literally rivals the Oscars. And it was just on the Hallmark Channel. It's um, now going to be streaming on Hallmark if anybody has the Hallmark app. And it was so good this year. When we started doing it, you know, back in 1992, we've been in the ministry for a long time. When we started doing the gala, you know, people would come up and say, thank God, you know, sort of. Yes. Now, out of all the recipients, these were big movies. These were like movies to produce Avengers, produce Spider-Man, produced a Lego movie. And they all got up except one, one thank God, the rest of them all thank Jesus. And the Today Show featured one of the people we gave an award to, Kathy Lee Gifford. You know Kathy Lee. Oh, yes. And Kathy Lee grew up Jewish and became a Christian watching a Billy Graham film. Well, she had sent me her talk, which was really boring, but I said, it's Kathy Lee Gifford, and we're giving him an award. And she just got up and talked about Jesus. I've been following Jesus all my life. Jesus has made a difference. I couldn't imagine what he did. He gave me all my heart's desire. You know, God will put his desires on your hearts. And if you let him, he'll fulfill those desires. So that's the good news. Now, the highest grossing movies in Hollywood, what are they? Well, last year, uh, eight out of 10 of the top grossing movies had strong Christian worldview or content. And um, last year, 62% of the movies, and, and worldwide, 90%. So all, all over the world, these movies do even better if they have strong Christian content. Now, Hollywood puts, you know, when we started, they didn't put Christian content in. If there was a Christian, it was the priest in Colder guys about to stab somebody. But we've shown them this is a gigantic audience. Every week, about 125 million people go to church and about 25 million people go to movies. So what I say to Hollywood is you've got a lot of audiences. My wife's Argentine, you've got the Spanish-speaking audience, you've got the African-American. But this is the biggest audience because most of those people go to church. So if you want to reach this one, so Hollywood puts a little bit in and puts a worldview to try to reach that audience. But last year I was shocked. I was just shocked because it started out with How You Train Your Dragon, where the new young boy king is told that he's got to be a man so he can marry Astrid, the woman. And then the next one came out, Dumbo, again about marriage. The next one, Lego movie about marriage and him becoming a man so he can get married. Toy Story about leaving his toys behind so he can um, marry Bo Peep. Then The Lion King about him stopping hanging out with the guys and coming and getting married and taking his rightful place. So these are not politically correct themes. These are about men becoming men so they can get married. This is a pretty incredible thing. So how do you read that? I read it that we've had a tremendous influence in Hollywood and we've shown them what makes more money. Now they do, now they're putting in a little bit of you know, spice in it. So they'll have one character that's a little light and a little over. But I'm trying to get them to say, it's not gonna help you. In fact, I've wrestled with the Hallmark uh, Network and with other people. You've gotta stake the high road. You gotta do what reaches your audience. You know, they reach 90 million. And you don't wanna lose your audience. And Disney, they're gonna lose their audience if they start going south. Yeah. There used to be censors in Hollywood. When well, did that all go away? They weren't exactly censors. Um, during the golden age of Hollywood, Hollywood had been on the ropes in the 1920s. German films were doing better. Um, English films were doing better. That's where Alfred Hitchcock started out. And because Hollywood was doing poorly, Jack Warner, who gave my father his stage name, Robert Allen, and my father said he'll never forgive himself for doing that, called in these church representatives to see how they could reach the church audience. And what they did is they used to read the scripts and talk to the studios. And they'd say, because I inherited the files from the Protestant film on, they'd say, how many empty seats do you want in the theater? If you're going to put in the F word, you're not going to get my mother. If you're going to put in this, you're not going to get my daughter. So how many empty seats do you want? And they'd say to, to George Heimrich, who you know, was the Protestant film office, They'd say, well, George, if you're so smart, you tell us how we're going to change the script. And of course, you can always make the script better. There's, there's no doubt about it. You don't have to use the F word. Nobody goes to a movie to hear the F word. So what we do is we revive what the church film office, 
The churches closed down the film offices in the 1960s. Now, the backstory of that is not Hollywood, but there were a lot of liberals in the church. You know, when I came to Christ, I went to a liberal Episcopal cemetery, seminary, and uh, I was on the board of the National Council of Churches. They're the ones who shut down the Protestant film office. They had given up on the gospel. They've gone further. And so they're the ones who, who pulled the teeth of the, of the Motion Picture Code. The Motion Picture Code was not censorship. It was a standard to live by, like learning to live by the Ten Commandments, which I hope everybody out there knows that God's going to write them on your heart, and yeah. he'll give you the ability to do that. The, the uh, uh, most successful religious film, financially, what would that be and what constitutes or identifies one as a religious uh, film? You know, there, there are two types of Christian films. Um, actually, there are probably more, but I'll go through what we wrote in, in one of our stories about Christian film. There's the overtly historical Christian films. And if you take the one that reached more people than anything else, it was the 1920s King of Kings because it was a silent film and it reached more people than anybody. But there have been, those, there have been over 150 of those and they've been done by, since 1897. We remember the new ones. We remember Passion of the Christ and the Jesus film. Jesus film has been seen by two billion people and I helped them with that film. So, but you also have allegorical Christian films. Like I, my uh, daughter-in-law, is the goddaughter of C.S. Lewis's stepson and my granddaughter is the guy, et cetera. But anyway, when I was head of the Episcopal, they owned the rights to Lion, the Witch of the Wardrobe. We got it on CBS television. We won an Emmy Award. Doug Gresham became a friend of us. But that's an allegory. Aslan represents Jesus in that film. It's not an overt, but he goes to the cross. Instead of the cross, it's a stone table. It's an allegory. And there are lots of allegorical films. Uh, and especially in some of the big you know, action adventure films. Like my favorite Captain America, you know, he, he won't kill Bucky. Bucky says, you know, you won't. He, Bucky throws him out, he gets baptized, he gets resurrected, <laughs> and that happened. So there's the allegorical film, there's the overt, overt yeah. uh, historical film, and then there are a lot of films that just have reference. Have, and what we do is we look at the films in terms of 150 criteria. So the big battle in philosophy for 2,000 years was with, between Aristotle and Plato on, on ontology, the nature of being. And Plato believed that being was just an imaginary thing, that we were looking in a cave and it was all an illusion, just like the Hindus do. And Aristotle was a doctor's son and he believed there was a real world and he believed that it was all materialistic. Now out of his socialism, out of Plato's nominalism. So Christians believe that it's both and, that it's fully God and fully man. They believe that it's a real world, real pain, real suffering that needs a real savior. But they also believe in miracles, signs, wonders, and those savior. Christians go wrong when they start to take the both and and separate them. Mm -hmm. You're right. Uh, I can only imagine, was that a religious film? Yeah, and it's a beautiful film, and it's about a reconciliation between a father and a son, and it's, a, it's got a lot of strong Christian content to it. Um, and it's, on, it's got a real ontology, he suffers real pain, a real epistemology, he finds out the truth. And it's got all those 150 criteria, um, so it's... it's uh, successful financially? It is, but I want these films to be more successful. I have, a, I have a person, a producer, teaching my next class who's gotten $14 billion at the box office. $14 billion for Hollywood is not a lot. At, you know, at uh, $10 a ticket, that's like, uh, you know, 1.4 billion people in a world of 7 billion people. But if I can only imagine squeezed up to almost 100 million after re almost 100 million, much smaller than some of these Hollywood films. So there's just things they can do to tweak it. So I teach people how to make better films. So for instance, a friend of mine who's a good Hollywood guy, 
made Unplanned, and I love Unplanned. It's a great movie. I've heard a lot but of the people love it. The most powerful anti-abortion pro-life movie made over $518 million. It was called Boss Baby, and it was made by another friend of mine. Boss and Baby? it's an animated movie. I it know. It starts off with heaven, when the babies are being created yeah. by God. We believe that. The God finds out that people are not having as many babies. We believe that. So we have a demographic winner going on. So he sends a little cherub down. The boy discovers that this is an angel, not, and he says, are you the boss? He said, no, no, Jesus is the real boss. It affirms Jesus. Satan is trying to stop people from having babies, which he's been trying to do since the Garden of Eden. We know this. You know, this made 518 million, and it talks about life. Good. And the well, importance that life was made Baby's kind of God. a mean little baby, though, at first, isn't he? What? Boss baby, he's kind of a mean little baby there for a while. I can't hear you this. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's okay. He's kind of a he was kind of a mean little baby at first, boss baby, as yeah. I recall. <laughs> he was a little angel. He was, oh, what? <laughs> he was on a mission from God. Right. All right, now, I love Jane Austen. Yeah. And me too. I love Jane Austen's movies. I'm I do too. Okay. And I've seen almost all of them. I, I have and two. And there were three that came out last year. And the thing of it is, they make a lot of money. Because they they're do. good, good story. She's a great story yeah. teller. But why don't they make more of those kind of movies that you really want to go and see, where you don't have to worry about the words, you don't have to worry. You don't about want me to tell you the answer. <laughs> I think she yes, does. Yes, I do. Okay. This is puzzling. They, they make they make movies for different audiences, which is what I said about. Uh, you know, the Hispanic audience, people who speak Spanish. My wife, being from Argentina, doesn't want to hear about Hispanic because she's not Hispanic. So they don't believe that in Argentina. But she speaks Spanish. She grew up Spanish. She, she's a sixth generation Argentine. So they make movies for that audience. They make movies for the Chinese audience. We should pray for them because of the, you know, coronavirus. And they make movies for women. And they make movies for young boys. And they make movies for children. Now, the big blockbusters, like Avengers, that do over a billion dollars, they try to reach all of those audiences. They've got a, you know, a woman character that's strong, they've got a man. But the fact of the matter is, and this is a little secret in Hollywood that we can't say in front of your camera. Okay. The fact of the camera, don't tell anybody, yeah. don't, don't yeah. tell them. I swear. Is that, you know, the biggest audience for movies is between 16 and 24. For an 18-year-old, movies are a cheap date. You know, first place, it's $10 a ticket. That's a lot cheaper than going to a sports game or something else, which is $100. You get to take your date. You don't have to talk to her. If it's scary, <laughs> she gets to hold your hand. And then you go out and you talk about the movie. you got something to talk about. It's a cheap date. Women will go to movies that men go to. I shouldn't say this. But men will not go to movies that women go to. So let's just take another category, African-American film. Tyler Perry, none of his mil movies have gone over $100 million. $10 a ticket, that's 10 million people. That's really, that's his audience. The women's films will go up to maybe $180, $190 million. But women will go to movies that men go to. I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah, I know, that's, I know. That's just the nature of it. But Pride and Prejudice did very well, and it they did. last but a they're, long they're, time. They're not in the billion dollar category. Really? Well, that's where you are now, billion. Billions. So, you know, you want movies that get billions of dollars. Now, there are always exceptions. So everybody out there, there's always an exception. Most of the top grossing movies, like 98% come from the six major studios. Fox has been devoured, so it's probably five studios now but they make 98% of the money. But the exceptions are movies like My Big Fat Greek Wedding, which was an independent film that a friend of mine helped distribute. And they put it into old rundown theaters and it made a couple hundred million dollars. So there's always exceptions, don't worry about it. So why would a movie like Parasite win? Like what? Parasite. Well, Parasite is not a big movie in terms of people. Parasite is a very mean movie. It's, uh, you've seen Parasite. Uh, you know, it's about this, this family that pretends to be domestic people. I mean, 
South Korea is one of my favorite countries. I've spoken in South Korea so many times. They're very Christian, they're very clean, they're very decent, they're above board. They're not, they're not, they're anti-communist. This is a very pro-communist movie. You have a couple of servants that come to work for this family. They lock one of them up in the basement and eventually they kill the family members, the wealthy family, and take over his house. So this is all about getting rid of the people with money and wealth. Now, the story should have been told that these guys were on the street, they were starving, these people took them in, they gave them their house, they gave them everything, but that wasn't the story. The story about killing, you know, the wealthy capitalist who's such an evil person that he's making money to hire you and pay you money. It's a very mean-spirited. Parasite is a parasite. The movie is a parasite. Yeah. Good so name it for it. So succeeded in Hollywood. Yeah. There were a lot of good Korean films last year. We honored The Tower two years ago. There are a lot of good Japanese films. There are a lot of good Chinese films. But they honored the movie that had the most anti-Christian, anti-capitalist, anti-everything Content. That's Hollywood for you, really, isn't it? Explain how is it the top grossing Hollywood stars that make 20 million a month pay per movie are socialists in their thinking, in their politics? Well, what is, I, I mean, and they live in the you know, $10 million homes, sometimes 20, 40 million, and they are wanting a well, nation you know, that is. My, my that parents were stuff. My parents were stars, and they were into Edgar Cayce and what we call ontological anomalism, you know, believe in, you know, et cetera. I don't want to go too far in that direction, but it was magical thinking, basically. And a star, you know, there are a lot of good books about this, about stars who crash and burn, and they thought that they were stars they didn't know. It's like magic somehow. A lot of times it's just because of the look they have, because of the ability they have. And they're not making it like they make widgets or gadgets or, you know, work the camera or, or actually put together. The, they're the ones who are just doing it without knowing how did I make it to this point. So they think everything is given to them. They're, they're born socialists. They're socialists by their very so profession. Is it guilt with the money they have? Well, the guilt is a part of it, but the biggest part of it is that they just don't understand the value. Look, have you ever worked on a movie? No. If you work on a movie, I, you know, I had to be on my father's movies. I played the friend of Eddie Duchin and the Eddie Duchin. You, you, you do about five minutes of work, and then you got the rest of the day to run around, to do nothing. My father would always nap in the corner. You know, there, there are lots of stories about it. Will Ferrell always locks himself in his trailer and watches TV. A friend of mine was the assistant director, knocked on Will Ferrell's door or you got to come on the set for five minutes and Will Ferrell said get away from here blah 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 you know I'm not coming out until I want to so they're they're privileged they're spoiled right <laughs> yeah they're spoiled I got a Christmas card can you can you see this I mean that is I just, know I just tell them beautiful I, I mean I mean that is the best casting for a <laughs> picture I've ever seen well they're reading the Bible yeah. <laughs> they love the Bible. Uh, I've got a, I've got 13 of those little 13 characters. now. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. They're beautiful. How, beautiful family. How is your beautiful wife? My wife has been on uh, chemo for 23 years. Uh, she has different problems, you know, operations on, you know, her tongue in October, operations on something. So now she's in Houston for about six weeks for an operation on her eye, uh, so, you know, different parts of her body. Prayer, she needs prayer. But, you know, the doctor said he got more than he ever thought, and every day is a chance. She called me while we were getting yes, on the program, yes. but I couldn't answer, because I'm talking to you, because I love you. Wow. I love you a lot. I am so honored to be with, with you today. And I'm, we, we I'm honored to be yes. with you. Yes. It, is, it is amazing. But, what is this all about? Because that's a devotional. They have your website. We have about that's, two that's minutes That's a left. devotional. People love this devotional. You watch a film and it unpacks a film in terms of scripture. Well, yeah, I was on, I think Steve Strang or somebody's uh, program, and they said they they promoted. We just wrote a devotional in 
you know, it takes you five minutes a day. Well, this takes you about three hours because you've got to watch it now. <laughs> this is deeper, right? <laughs> but people love it, so it's okay. Yeah, uh, that's great. How many books have you authored? Oh, uh, let's see, it's over 35 or 36. Yeah, a lot of books. You know, contributed to, authored, solely authored, brought in co authors. I don't think I've ever done it. We got about a minute left. Share Christ with somebody watching. Well, the good news is that um, in John 10.10, 10, Jesus says the thief comes to steal, and then when he can't steal, he has to kill and destroy the evidence. And that was what was happening in my life. But he says in John 10.10 10, at the end, he came, Jesus, to give you a more abundant life. So what I tell my friends in Hollywood and what I'm telling you now, if you want to escape from all of the trials and tribulations, not that you won't have problems, but if you want to escape from the world, the flesh, and the devil, the good news is you can have abundant life in Jesus Christ. Just ask him into your life, and he will give you more than you can imagine. Amen. What an honor. God bless you. We're going to be praying for you. Thank you. Going through everything you can imagine. And Lily, be, right? Yes, Lily. We're going to be praying for her. Jesus Christ is the answer to every need That's you right. may have. Take the Word of God today. That's why we do these programs, to challenge you not only to trust Christ as Savior, but to open the Bible. I read through the Bible, this is my 31st year. Every time I read through it, it's like reading a new book. That's right. I challenge you to read at least two chapters today. That's easy. Open the Word of God, Jesus Christ, is the answer to every need you may have. Thanks for watching.